Reddington is shown in the first scene of the blacklist spotting a coin in the middle of the roadway in front of Washington Square Park. A truck speeding along Washington Street North honks as Red stops there, but Red doesn't respond. In fact, he appears almost unaware of the car that almost hit him. Red takes the coin in his hand and says to a curious bystander, Heads. Good fortune. All of this is quite alarming because the Red we know doesn't believe in luck and is extremely concerned with surviving. Something is definitely wrong with Reddington, but let's review our interesting cases before we get back to that. In this episode, Cooper finally convinced Reddington to give him a case, but unlike before, Reddington provided three hot cases to Cooper, which shocked even members of the task force. The task force divided the cases among themselves. They believe all the cases are related because Reddington never does things randomly. Wrestler started by investigating the first case, which is that of a personal injury lawyer, Rebecca Anderson, who Red believes is stealing from her clients and funding something criminal. A former client of Anders praises her about his million-dollar settlement, but Cooper figures out that the company actually paid out over $3 million. The lawyer made the settlement private, including non-disclosure agreements, so she could make two separate sets of paperwork. In interrogation, Wrestler tries to get Anders to confess to a larger criminal conspiracy that is worthy of a true blacklister, but this case isn't that complex. Just an ethically challenged lawyer funding her lavish lifestyle. Case solved. The second case is that of a fertility clinic that lost all of its embryos in a power outage, a loss so massive that the company happily accepted the FBI's help. Malik and Demve head to investigate whether this was, as Red suggests, a big conspiracy. The clinic runs its systems through a company called Adabo Comtech. Their representative, Todd Wagner, can't figure out why the multiple alarm systems and backup generators failed all at the same time. The task force thinks this is too much of a coincidence, and Agent Malik asks for the client list to check if there is a client that was specifically targeted. FBI techies discover that someone hacked the security system internally, and once Malik sees the client list, she has a good guess who. Among those who lost embryos were Amy and Alexander Adabo, owners of the same security company used by the clinic. At their company headquarters, Malik and Demve interview the owner and his much younger wife. They seem legitimately devastated by the loss of their embryos, especially since Alex is now sterile due to a testicular cancer treatment that was done to him after he gave out the sperm. This means Alex cannot give birth, and so the damage is irreplaceable. Malik explains to the couple that the hack was most likely internal, and Amy immediately knows who to blame. Alex objected to her suspicion, but she shot down Alex's objections with her anger, saying, you always protect him, and summoned the employee to the conference room. The mystery employee is none other than Todd Wagner, Alex's son, Amy's stepson, and resentful eldest boy. Todd Wagner was interrogated and the truth was simply revealed. Rather than share his father's inheritance with a resentful stepmom and what he calls just a cell in a Petri dish, Todd Wagner decided to destroy all the embryos in the facility, knowing well that his father could not donate another sample for the procedure. Agent Malik is furious and disgusted during the interrogation, after learning what Todd Wagner did. It reminds her of all the sacrifices her mother, Agent Mira Malik, made for her family. She tells him that he's lucky to have been arrested by her and not by the original Agent Malik, who sacrificed everything for family. You should be glad you're talking to me and not my mother, because she would have left you broken and bleeding. It was really amazing and lovely to see her remember Agent Malik as her mother, even though she knows that Mira Malik is not her biological mother. The last case is that of an angel of mercy, an alleged serial killer who kills patients in the hospital. It involves three suspicious heart attack deaths at the same hospital. Herbie looks over the medical data and discovers that there were no underlying medical reasons for any of these patients to die from heart attacks. There was, however, a large amount of potassium in their systems that could have caused the fatal attacks, but during death, red blood cells burst and naturally flooded the system with potassium, which is why pathologists attributed the excess potassium to those natural causes. Herbie hypothesizes that potassium would be an ideal weapon of choice for a murdering angel. Herbie also deduces who had access to all three patients, a traveling nurse named Dawn Jacobus. When we see her starting her shift at the hospital, she's asking about a specific patient. Wrestler rushes in and arrests Dawn before she can finish attaching the IV. In interrogation, the nurse protests her innocence. Lucky for her, Herbie has been testing IV bags from Dawn's hospital. He later found out that it was not an angel of mercy but a manufacturing error because some random IV bags have a large amount of lethal potassium. The CEO of Callback Medical Solutions, the company that produces the IV bags, is not happy to be speaking to the FBI. He also calls Malik Young Lady as she asks him some questions. On their way out of the meeting, Wrestler promises to prosecute anyone who knew about the tainted medical supplies. This freaks out the head of product safety, who asks for immunity in exchange for information. It turns out less than 1% of their IV bags were incorrectly manufactured, so the CEO decided against a recall and just hoped no one would connect the dots. These cases seem almost too simple to the task force, so much so that Cooper amusingly refuses to even call them blacklisters. 
The team looks over the files again, and Wrestler catches a photo from a charity event hosted by Wild Society, a non-profit organization that protects biodiversity. The picture is of Wild Society's board of directors, including the three familiar non-blacklisters, Todd Wagner, Rebecca Anders, and the CEO of Callback Medical. That's right, bonus case. By the time Cooper meets with the director of Wild Society, they've already fired the three arrested board members and prepared a binder of information for the FBI. In the donor list, Cooper finds an anonymous donation of $52.5 million. A little probing reveals a name, Stephen Homan. As we the Blacklist fans know, Stephen Homan is one of Red's favorite aliases. Now, he's the main benefactor of Wild Society. Case solved. Wrestler is angry that, once again, the task force was doing an errand for Red, in this case, rooting out corruption in the organization, before he gave them a metric ton of cash. I am angry that, once again, Wrestler has forgotten that doing Red's bidding has been his literal job for 10 years. When Demve later visits Red, Red is in a retrospective mood. The massive donation is to try to leave a better world for Agnes. After all, what's the point of making sure she's safe if there's not a decent world for her to live in? Demve admires the gift but questions the rest of the giveaways Red has been doing lately. Red insists he's done holding on to material wealth for the sake of it, like the people they just finished arresting. But is everything all right? Demve presses. Everything's fine, Demve. Reddington replies. Once again, that answer doesn't seem entirely true. Something is definitely going on inside Red's head. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more thorough reviews.